All right, thanks for coming, everybody. So uh, first of all, uh, excuse me for the jacket, but I'm freezing my rear end off in this place. I'm all the way here from Africa. The least you could do is put the heat on for me. <laughs> Jeez. All right, so um, uh, yeah, this is me. This is the, this is the point of this talk. Uh, it, I know it says Hackers for Charity Update, but that sounds a little bit like a news service or I don't know, something. But uh, this, is, this is what I'm gonna be doing today. I'm gonna, uh, one, I'm gonna try to give you some advice. Uh, two, I'm going to embarrass myself. And uh, three, I'm going to say thank you. So well, you have to keep me on track here, make sure I actually accomplish all this stuff. So uh, let's get to it. You guys know how my interests work, or my intros work. This is, uh, this is me, you guys know me as uh, this, and uh, this, and this, and of course this. Uh, but uh, after all of that stuff, I decided to uh, do something a little bit crazy. So I quit my job, uh, sold all of my stuff, and moved from here to here, which uh, it looks really pretty in a black and white slide, and it looks very simple, but that's, uh, that's actually 21 and a half hours in the air to be here with you kind folks. So thank you very much. Now, I know what you're thinking. I know what you're thinking. Uh, why Uganda? You know, people have asked me this question over and over again. I try to, you know, I try to explain it, the long version of the story, but the short version of the story is, you know, Uganda is really no different than any other place. I mean, they, they have their own rules. Uh, this is a nice little sign I saw that says, do not urinate, fine of 50,000 shillings. So, you know, they have rules. Um, I can still, uh, I can do a lot of the stuff that I'm used to doing. Uh, I can still go out for breakfast and uh, I can go through and, uh, get some drive through chicken, you know, and when I'm a little bit hungry. Uh, drive through comes in a couple different forms. This is the other drive through chicken guy. Uh, I live in a, uh, in a nice house with a shiny, prickly red gate where a nice man named Joseph looks after us. Uh, I traded in the minivan for this nice, sturdy truck. And, uh, you know, my kids are happy to, to let you know they have pets. Uh, this, one, this one they named Fred. And uh, this one was Tony. He had a posse. So we had to, uh, we got a cat to get rid of the posse. And uh, the, unfortunately, the thing I'm thinking is, you know, this is Africa, right? The circle of life, what eats cats? You know, that's, I guess, what we got to worry about next. Uh, but we have, uh, we have all the modern conveniences. This is the Best Buy. <laughs> and uh, here's the Walmart. And here's the Target. And that's a Safeway. Yes, those are all the same exact places. <laughs> that's basically all we got. Now, when I first got to Uganda, uh, yeah, I was very, whoa, should I just turn this off? Is that going to tick anybody off? Gone. Right, you know, you guys have heard some of my stories about this stuff. There was internet, but you had to follow an equation. What I had to do is I had to add this plus this plus this to get something that looked like this to get something that looked like this. <laughs> how fun YouTube is at 10K. They can't. Uh, they can't hear me? All right, so let's kill the feedback. Let's try some bad. Yeah, it's on. Ready? Let's go less hot. Hello, test, 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 test. Better? OK. All right, if there's any more pain, I'm turning it off again. <laughs> Just kidding. I'm, I'm giving you a hard time. All right, so, uh, but anyway, you know, Uganda isn't all that bad. Uh, it's just like any other place. They have, they have problems, of course. It's just the problems there are a bit more deadly than other places. Uh, sometimes a bit irritating. The naughty goat thing is especially bad. I'm not going into any details. So this, of course, begs an obvious question, and uh, I, I do get this. Uh, no, actually, I've never gotten this. Nobody's had the guts to ask me this in person. But I can tell from the looks on your faces, some, some people are just like, dude, what are you doing? I mean, after all, I had achieved some level of success in the industry. I had an awful lot of stuff going for me. Uh, but when, when this Uganda thing came along, I was kind of in this spot where despite all this stuff, I felt like my life didn't count for much. Um, I didn't feel like I was making much of a difference. Uh, now, some of you have seen me talk about this uh, at DEF CON 17, but because this is a, this is a new conference, um, I want to give everybody the full picture of how this thing came about at, at every new conference. So some of you might have seen this before. But I'm going to tell you my life story, and parts of it are embarrassing. Now see, I was a, I was a pretty innocent kid, and uh, I only wore lederhosen once. But that, 
that propelled me to a level of innocence that far succeeds most of you people. Um, but I, I, there was a dark side, there was a dark side, and uh, it's, it started brewing at a very early age when I was introduced to this thing. Uh, how many of you have actually used one of these? Rock on, excellent. Yeah, this is the trash, uh, the TRS-80. Uh, I didn't own one of these, but there was one at the local mall. Radio Shack had one right out in the front. And basically what I would do is I would take my notepad with a, with a pencil and I would write down computer programs. I would get books from the library and I'd write my, my programs on a, on a pad of paper. And then I'd go to Radio Shack and then I'd type them in and then I'd run them. And then I'd use this thing called an eraser, you know, on the notepad to, to debug. That was, that was my debugger. And uh, I was so fascinated with these things, eventually, you know, my parents bought me my own, and this was the computer that, uh, that they bought me, the TI-99-4A, the Bill Cosby computer. And this, this is when things started to get uh, leet. I started taking programming courses in my backyard under a tree with a black and white television. And there was something really interesting about this time that I, I hope a lot of you remember. Uh, this, was, this was a very magical time with technology. You know, if you could program, if you knew how computers worked and you knew how to do all this kind of stuff, you were, you were special. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't common. Oh yeah, you code, what language? It was, oh, you program? <laughs> it was this foreign thing. It was really a, really a cool time. My next upgrade was to the Commodore 64. Yeah, we're getting, I, I'm expecting more cheers as we get closer to, <laughs> to current times. Uh, I had a modem, uh, the modem, I believe this one was about 1200 baud, which is pretty close to the speeds I had in Africa when I moved there. Uh, but this, uh, this setup connected me to a new group of people through BBSs. Uh, this was the first time that I was introduced to hackers. Although I, I don't really know if that was the, the common term at the time, but it was, you know, the HP VAC groups, you know, the, the hacking, freaking, viruses, uh, what was the other one? Um, was that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So any, I don't even remember the acronyms. That's how old I'm getting. But these people were different, right? They thought outside the box. Uh, they pushed the envelope, and they solved difficult problems very elegantly. It was a great group. With the knowledge that I got from this group, I started to tinker and experiment, and I learned, and I just was a sponge at this time of my life. I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't read enough. And before I knew it, I had my first identity. You know, the first, the first thing that I could call myself as part of a group that was I was a hacker. So. Uh, even though at 12 I looked like this, uh, unbelievable, I, I hoped that one day I would look something like this. And, and I remember sneaking around in my, in my neighborhood with spy gear and a ninja sword made out of a dowel rod and you know, spy gear made out of Lego bricks. And you know, I would be a super high tech ninja digital spy nerd. <laughs> it, was, it was terrible. Um, you know, but in reality, even though I thought all these things, you know, were pretty cool, I was, just a, I was just an average guy. I did absolutely no homework in school, and I aced all my tests, so that gave me a solid C average, which is, it's like an A for an average guy, right? That's what you strive for. Everything about me was average. Uh, I got my first 386. My dad got a deal through some guy at work, brought home a 386, so that opened the door to Windows and Linux. And uh, I, just, I just started playing around. I took apart that machine so many times and put it back together. And most of the times I put it back together, it worked. Uh, eventually, I started playing around with other stuff. This is a black and white TV. I'm not going to ask how many people remember these things. But uh, I had a black and white TV. And I remember I used to play with the uh, UHF and VHF dials and cranked up the knob so high on this thing, you had to take the faceplate off and crank it with a set of pliers to get it up to the 900 megahertz range, which was where cell phone conversations were, you know? And so I'm listening to cell phone conversations through my black and white TV. And as my horizons started to expand and I started getting more and more interested in stuff, eventually I bought a radio scanner from Radio Shack. It was the Pro 150. And uh, I did probably the scariest thing I had ever done in my young life and cracked open the case and soldered to the inside of the thing an audio jack so I could plug it into my sound card so I could get you know, a, a pre-digital output from the scanner and plugged it into to my, my machine and eventually ran some software that was grabbing pager data. You guys probably remember this stuff. Some of you remember Poxag and Flex and all the old pager protocols. The next thing you know, I've got pages scre you know, scrolling on my screen. Uh, one night I saw uh, an interesting page uh, talking about a firewall that was going down. And it turned out this happened every Sunday 
this particular message would come out saying the firewall is going down, this system's going down, it would give an IP address, and I routed the IP address back to none other than the White House. It turned out that every Sunday they recycled all their security systems and all their computers, and the system administrator had set up this pager to let him know when it was gonna happen and uh, let the whole world know as well. Uh, in an interesting, uh, ironic change of turn of events, uh, the firewall on that system failed open. Those were, those were the days. I can't talk any more about that story. Yeah, so eventually, you know, I learned so much that I, college kind of came around and I thought, well, obviously I'm gonna get into computers and started taking courses and, you know, talk to the guidance counselor who to this day is probably still appalled at me. Uh, and she, she said, you know, you should get into computers and this is what you take and here's the course. So I signed up for the courses and started taking RPC and COBOL. Um, how many people remember these hideous things? Oh, thank you, I wasn't alone. If I had stuck with COBOL, I'd be incredibly wealthy right now, right? Y2K rolled around and I'd, I'd be on the Caribbean chilling. Um, but I argued with them and I said, these are the stupidest languages ever created. RPC is ridiculous. Anything where you have to line up characters into specific columns is just retarded. And uh, they said, well, you don't have to do that with COBOL. And I said, yeah, but what's COBOL good for? And they're like, business reports. And I'm like, well, those are retarded too. <laughs> And at that point, I was coding in Fortran, and I was learning with learning, you know, C, and and I just had no use for this. So I ended up dropping out of college and pursuing my own education, which uh, I tell my kids they absolutely, positively will not do until they can outhack me, <laughs> which is coming way too quickly. Um, so I eventually landed a decent job. I started working for CSC, and they, you know, they had their, you know, professional hacker and poster boy, and you know, things kind of came together for me. You know, I was very young in my career, but I had learned enough to actually hold this job. And uh, before long, uh, pictures like this were actually, you know, real. This was this was me. Um, you know, these were a couple guys that I worked with. We started a group called Strike Force, and. You know, we were doing the real stuff, man. I mean, we were breaking into buildings, we were breaking into networks, we were doing th this really sexy work. And uh, the press loved it, the press ate it up. And uh, I had made it, you know, I was, I was making a really decent salary and all that stuff. And, but even, even though I had done all that, I wanted more. And it's kind of hard to tell from this picture, but in this picture, this corporate CSC, you know, newsletter thing, I'm wearing a DEF CON shirt. And at the time, you know, this was, uh, this was something that was, had evaded me. I felt like I needed to do more. Now back in the 90s, if you wanted to really make it, you didn't just go out and get a job. You, you did specific things, like you wrote articles in FRAC. You wrote an article for FRAC and that put you on the map. So I was like, I put together this article on steganography thumbprinting and, you know, made it, made it through a, you know, pseudonym that I made up and created this little whatever and published an article in FRAC. And the next thing that you did was you got, you got accepted to speak at DEF CON, right? That was the next thing that put you on the map. So uh, DEF CON 11 rolled around and uh, I gave my first talk. How many people actually saw that talk? One, two, okay, I have to give two very specific apologies, one to you and one to you because that was hideous. <laughs> um, See, when I got on stage, I was full of myself, right? You know, I, I, had pub I had been published in FRAC, and here I am, a DEF CON speaker, and dude, I showed up with my speaker badge, and I was the man. You know, I stepped up on that stage, and I was ready for it all. I was like, bring on the groupies, you know, bring on all the parties, you know? I'm, I'm, this is it, this is it, I'm the man, and I gave this really horrible talk. Well, what I was doing was I was trying to emulate certain people that I respected. You know, and back in the day, there were, you know, some people that were kind of on the scene. Um, guy in the bottom right is Demon9. I hope a lot of you remember him, Mike Schiffman. Um, you know, people like this, I loved their stage present, uh, presence. I loved their rock star image, and I tried to be them. And I put together this talk for DEF CON 11 called Watching the Watchers, and it was about this Google hacking thing. And uh, I tried to have this, <laughs> what these guys had. Now imagine taking all four of these guys and putting their faces together into a morphing program and coming up with one person, then make it female. <laughs> and uh, that would be about how scary it is to try to put all these people together and be them. And that's what I was. It was obnoxious, it was terrible. I watch it and I'm just like, who was that guy? Um, so I wanted to be somebody and I achieved my dreams. I got to FRAC, you know, wrote, wrote in FRAC, got to DEF CON, got to the top, and uh, the view sucked. 
You know, this was the culmination of my career. This was the culmination of all my work. All the hours spent alone in my room with a red light bulb trying to be Uber. And uh, at some point, uh, right around 2004, I fell, back on my, I fell back on my Christian upbringing and I wrote on my blog that I am a Christian, which to me was a big deal at the time because I knew that this was kind of suicide. You know, you don't talk about like religion in like the hacker community, you don't take a stand. But to me, it was kind of a real thing and I just prayed this prayer. I was like, God, do something with my life. And uh, interesting things started to happen. You know, I kind of took the view off of myself and was like, you know what, it's not all about me. Three weeks later, Singris approached me and they're like, do you want to write a book on that really amazing talk that you did? <laughs> At that point, I'm trying to figure out, like, you know, who's punking me? I'm like, what is this? This has got to be a joke. It took me six months to make up my mind and say yes, and then it took me three months to write the book, and uh, it just exploded. Then uh, Grifter came to me and he's like, hey, you want to help me with my book? And I was like, dude, yeah. So I helped Grifter with his book, and then Aaron came to me and said, do you want to help me with my book? And I was like, ah, absolutely. So did that, and then uh, Bruce Potter, you remember him from the pictures, one of these guys that I just you know, adored, looked up to, one of my idols came to me and said, hey, do you want to help me out with my book? And I was just floored. I was like, yeah, absolutely. And it just kept getting better. The next, uh, the next couple books were Stealing the Network series, and this was where all the rock stars were, right? I mean, all the rock stars at the time pretty much contributed to this series. So Singer has called me in to work with these people who every single one of them I looked up to and I knew that they were all smarter than me and cooler than me. And uh, this, thing, this thing just turned into a rocket ride. You know, all the books that were, that were done, were a lot of them were translated into a bajillion different languages and then the press thing started to happen and you know, the fame just exploded. And this, is, this was an interesting time, and I won't even get into all the weird stuff that happened with celebrity sightings. Yeah, that's uh, Vanilla Ice and Jenny McCarthy and Paris Hilton. Um, these, these were just, uh, these were weird times, <laughs> to say the least. Uh, but, you know, life was good, you know? It, it was, I was kind of on the upswing again. Cool stuff was starting to happen. I got into the book thing. I got really pulled into it, you know? Um, and I, I started to lose sight again. Uh, my forums exploded. They went from 500 users to 80,000 users in a span of about two months, which was kind of ridiculous, uh, thanks to the Google hacking database and people that were on there. Um, and, you know, that Google, that Google book, that wasn't even my stuff, you know. People submitted queries in the community. This was community effort, and I was reaping the reward of that. You know, I acknowledged everybody. In fact, in the first, in the first edition of Google hacking, I listed, like, four pages of, you know, credits to every person that submitted a query. I, I mean, I wasn't passing it off as my own work, but still, I was reaping the reward. Then something interesting happened on my forums. Uh, how many of you remember Our God? Show of hands. Anyone? Oh, I'm so glad to see that. A few of you remember Our God. This guy wrote exploits to the tune of like three a day. He wrote like PHP exploits like crazy. Uh, he was the first, the first person that I know of that actually put a Google dork in an exploit. You know, and said, okay, here's a PHP exploit, here's how you Google to find targets. And he was submitting all this stuff through my website. You know, we were getting first release on all of this stuff, which drew more people to the forum and all that stuff. Uh, well, eventually, after some time, he just stopped posting, and I found out some months later that the guy, the, the kid had actually died. <laughs> you know, he was in the last months of his life, he had a debilitating disease, he couldn't get out of his room, he spent all of his time in front of the computer, and to basically lift up my image, you know? That's what, this, that's what the effect of his work was doing, and he died, and I didn't even know it. Um, and of course, I, I started to feel absolutely miserable all over again, and here I was at another height in my career just feeling absolutely miserable. But uh, things were about to change. Uh, my wife, Jen, uh, went to Uganda on a two-week two -week trip, and she came back with pictures like this. This is uh, Colin. This, uh, this little kid is absolutely butt naked, which is why I took the picture that way. There's really no other way to take a picture of him without exposing that. Um, every single picture of this kid was smiling, this big, goofy, drooling smile, you know, and laughing and all this stuff. And uh, I, the story about him is that, you know, his parents had died, HIV, AIDS, and malaria, um, and he lived with his grandmother in a little place kind of like this. But this kid was, was happy you know, all the time. So I'm thinking to myself, she gets back and she shows me this. I'm like, here's this little kid, so happy. He's got nothing. And here I am, I've got everything I always wanted and more, and I'm miserable. And uh, some, things, some things started to change, and I, I felt like, I gotta go to Uganda. So 
the way this thing typically works, if you want to go on like some sort of missions trip or foreign trip or whatever, is you call all your friends and you're like, hey, I want to do this thing and save the world, send me some money, but I didn't really have any friends. Uh, at least not in real life, all my friends were digital. <laughs> so I blogged about it, sent out some emails, and before long, uh, all the money came in and hackers paid for our trip to Uganda, East Africa. 100% of the trip, my wife and I, for that first trip, yeah. So I went to Uganda and I found crap like this. They found out I was a computer guy and I found absolute garbage. This is where all the throwaway stuff that you guys don't even want. <laughs> you know, you can't, you're like, I cannot find a blessed thing to do with this. I'm getting rid of it. Well, Africa is where a lot of that stuff ends up. And they, you know, people send it over there and we fixed it up and turned it into, you know, a respectable computer training lab. And I was like, man, this is, this is kind of cool. You know, I felt good about the work that I was doing, even though it wasn't like uber stuff. Uh, but at the end of the two weeks trip, they pulled us all together, the group in Uganda, and they said, we want to thank you for coming, and this very important phrase, we want to thank you for saving lives. And I was like, but they, you know, they were just computers. And the interesting thing was that their computer problems, they used their computers for administrative stuff to keep track of their records and their finances. People would send money from the U.S. to feed kids, and the computers would be eaten by viruses and dust, and they would lose it all. So, like, kids wouldn't eat. So doing computer repair and antivirus was actually saving lives. And I wasn't prepared for that. You know, I'm not like a doctor or whatever. But it w these were immediate life-changing results as a result of the work that I did. And uh, I got back from this trip, got settled into my, you know, corner office and my dream job, sat down to, you know, my laptop, and I tried to find the saving lives button, and I found it to be missing. <laughs> you know, I couldn't, I couldn't recreate that experience. So I started thinking about it. I was like, if I can do all of this as one person, imagine what a bunch of us could do. So I started Hackers for Charity as a way to sort of say, hey, there's this really cool thing that involves technology that you can do, which is like outside the box for you know, social good. And uh, it was a, it's an interesting concept, but at the time I was like, you know, nobody's gonna be interested in this. It's helping poor kids. It's, you know, it's, it, it, even to my excited self who was very excited about it, I could step back and go, this is kind of weird. <laughs> This is, this is strange and, I don't know, maybe a little bit lame, but I gotta try it anyway. Well, eventually somebody stepped forward. We had a volunteer that was like, it's cool what you're doing. I'm a PHP coder, is there anything I can do? And the group we visited was like, yeah, we need a child sponsorship site so we can get these kids on the web so people can pay for their medical expenses and all that. So we spec'd it out and the spec was for $50,000 and six months of labor. That was the original uh, cost estimate on this thing. Paul stepped in and did it in a week for free with just like a case of Red Bull. <laughs> the result was 61 children sponsored. And this was full expenses, man. I mean, this was like their medical, this was their medical supplies, this was their education, this was their food, this was everything. So at this point I had the bug. Um, I was, it, I had had a really decent break between writing and uh, I got the opportunity to write another book, uh, No Tech Hacking, and put the Hackers for Charity logo right on the front and said, I'm gonna donate all the proceeds to you know, the work that's going on in Africa. And this, this thing outstripped basically all the other books that I did combined in sales. Um, because honestly, it, you know, it came from the heart. It was, it was my own style, it was me not trying to be somebody else. I was writing in a style that was me and you know, it was for a good cause. Um, the hacker community made this happen. I mean, it was people like you buying this book that made this incredible thing happen. I said to AOET, what do you want me to do with all this money we're raising? And they said, well, don't send it to Uganda, send it to Kenya because the famine there is even worse than it you know, will ever be here. So we put that money in and we started doing these food drives in, in uh, Kenya. Uh, we gave out you know, cornmeal and, and uh, you know, uh, cooking oil and meat and just all this stuff to help these people that were starving. And in the end, it was about 1,500 families uh, that you know took advantage of this and one video clip that we have has a bunch of uh, Kenyans saying uh, thank you hackers please come back again which uh, I, I don't think that's ever happened in history <laughs> anywhere in the world huh? Sony. Sony yes well, pl well played <laughs> a shirt for that one <laughs> Uh, so they took this, uh, this was a cool thing, but then AOET scaled it up and they're like, well, we're going to take the money and now we're going to buy farmland and we're going to teach people how to farm and grow their own food. And after they do it for a season and prove they can do it, they own the land and it just became this amazing, this amazing program. 
Uh, we, the hacker community raised about $2,000 and we sent that to Kenya where they stood up a computer training center and started teaching people computers in the same area where people were starving. People were learning computers and getting jobs basically from the money that you guys sent over. So uh, this was getting close to what I felt in Uganda, right? But it was, it was still kind of writing checks. Um, and in my mind, it wasn't the same. You know, I still, I, it still wasn't the same. It, Uganda was all I could think about. Uh, it was, the same was true of my wife. And, um, you know, the thing, the thing that really um, grabbed me, though, was the community response to all this. Um, so at some point in uh, 2009, basically, we packed up everything, sold just about everything that we owned. I quit my job. I should say I quit my career, and with about two weeks spending money in our pocket, we hopped on a plane to Uganda, and it was a, it was a total leap of faith. Uh, and in the beginning, it was kind of rough, and one of the hardest things for me was being disconnected from that community, although I didn't realize that's what it was at the time. I missed this. You know, I, I didn't have internet access. You know, I, I missed um, this kind of stuff. But some interesting things happened. Some of you have heard about the PayPal incident. I'll talk about it again. Uh, when we were in Uganda, about the only way that we could get money was through PayPal. You know, people would send money through the website, and this money was paying for our existence. The hacker community stepped in and said, you know, you guys don't have any money, don't have any income, we're going to pay for you to live. And they did. For like a solid year, we had no income except that from the hacker community and some folks at like our church that, that put in some money. But at a certain point, we tried to change our PayPal account from a personal one to a business one, and I screwed it up. You know, I hit the wrong button and hit the 501c3 button and we weren't and tried to undo it and PayPal was like, uh, yeah, you can't undo, we're just going to freeze your account. And I was like, thanks for that. <laughs> and I'm on the phone with PayPal at the rate of like six or eight dollars a minute trying to get through their phone menu and I'm thinking about HD's talk and I'm like, man, if I had <laughs> just known that stuff, I could have <laughs> could have really cut through it. And, uh, and eventually it just hit a brick wall and I got ticked and I was like, I blogged. And I was like, PayPal shuts down Hackers for Charity. It was a little dramatic, you know, a little bit of drama queen in me. But I told the whole story. I was like, yeah, I screwed up, but now we don't have money. I, we don't have any money to live off of. I can't get access to this. And the community responded. That's an understatement. Within six hours, PayPal started sending me emails saying, can you make your people stop? Your account is, <laughs> is activated. This is the first of many, many thank you slides. Um, the other things that started happening with the community, this is just a dumb little chart. I hate charts. But the left-hand side, those small little bumps, that shows me trying to raise money to feed kids um, back in uh, 08 and early 09. And the, the big bars there are when people from the community stepped in. For example, April 22nd, the first big bump, Simple Nomad released the, you know, started releasing content through our website. April 30th, Roloff releases a Multigo super license exclusively through Hackers for Charity. We had an O-Day dropped in May 9th that was May 9th that was basically exclusive to us. And then in May 30th, Backtrack, the, the folks at Backtrack decided to release Backtrack 4 exclusively through the Hackers for Charity website. And those are those, those bumps. We started feeding hundreds of kids every month as a result of the community stepping in not just providing what they had, but paying for it. So that's uh, thank you slide number two. <laughs> so in Uganda, we started doing some interesting things. Volunteer teams started showing up. Uh, Tim and Dwight, fr then from White Wolf, you guys uh, probably know these folks, came in and they helped us set up a computer lab. They brought over some equipment and set up this really cool computer lab for AOET. Uh, we had uh, Monty Hoover come over, and he was a, a graduate student at West Point, and he convinced West Point to pay his trip to come to Uganda to actually do work there as part of his, you know, finishing up his course. So he came over and did an OLPC training thing. We started getting into more classrooms. This is the Rehabeth uh, Integrated School uh, in Uganda. The little sign there uh, says that this was built in honor of Sergey Brin and uh, his wife who personally paid for the building of the structure right in our backyard in Uganda. There was no press, there was no publicity, you can't look it up on Google, it does not exist. The only place it exists is here. He quietly reached into his pocket and paid for this thing, but he didn't put in a computer lab, <laughs> which I found to be kind of ironic, so <laughs> a bunch of hackers did it for him. 
We, uh, the hackers paid for all of this computer equipment. The community paid for all of this computer equipment. Some corporations stepped in to help out. We did another classroom in St. John's, Wachitaka. Um, we built a training center. We hired some staff. Uh, we opened the Hackers for Charity Computer Training Center in Uganda. This is what it looks like. It's all built off of donated equipment and money that was donated by the community. And the premise of this thing was to offer computer training for next to nothing. There were a lot of people offering computer training, but they wanted a lot of money for it, which in my mind defeated the purpose. So we tried to get a little bit of money for the training and it kind of failed. We didn't really have many customers, even though it was really cheap. So then we said, okay, well, we're gonna make it free to like NGOs and some groups like that. And what do you know, people started showing up. And uh, we started training all of these individual groups that were working in Uganda. Uh, before we know it, street kids were training right alongside the police, which was, in my mind, just as it should be, uh, taking computer training. We started the uh, Uganda, the Jinja Uganda Linux Users Group. Uh, this is, this is a film from our first meeting, which it's a good thing we did this because most Ugandans think that Vim is a toilet cleaner. <laughs> and of course, the closest thing they have to Unix is this, which is a driving college for uh, men with no um, skills. <laughs> the, uh, the other thing that we did in Uganda is we, we sort of said, well, you know, donors aren't gonna be around forever. Let's try to find a way to sustain our existence. Uh, Jinja is a tourist town, oddly enough, a stone's throw away from some of the worst poverty in the world. But a lot of tourists come through and they don't have any good food to eat, so we rented this gorgeous building which basically fell into our laps at a ridiculously low price. Uh, we opened this restaurant that served American food, cheeseburgers and milkshakes and onion rings and people came out of the woodwork. Um, and so the idea here was to kind of sustain what we were doing. So that's what we did from 2009 to 2010. Uh, but then things started falling apart. The wonderful classroom that we put in St. John's, uh, we'd walk in and we'd find, you know, chicken bones, you know, all over the tables and all this weird stuff and dead bugs all over the place and fingerprints all over the screen and, you know, equipment missing and we were just like, holy crap, what's going on? And we tried to help them with this. We're like, you're going to destroy the equipment and it didn't matter. We ended up pulling most of it because we were just watching it get obliterated before our eyes. That absolutely gorgeous computer lab, this was a picture of that computer lab that we did, remember, for the Google school? You know, we were, I was all excited because I was like, ooh, it's Sergey Brin and he's going to notice that hackers are helping him and then he'll, you know, write a paper that excuses all of us or whatever. <laughs> um, that lab went downhill very fast. Uh, they did not maintain it. They left the windows open. Water got in. Water damage got all over the place. Um, mold actually started growing in the screw holes of the monitors because the equipment had gotten wet and then put into the sun. Brand new equipment, mind you. Um, the bugs and the spiders and everything else were so bad that, you know, it was obvious they hadn't swept or mopped or even dusted. And I'm thinking, you know, I knocked myself out and begged people for money and went through all this work to do this. It just, it just kind of sucked. And at that point, uh, life got hard. Um, I honestly, you know, I missed technology. Um, I had done an awful lot, you know. I had uh, kissed off my career. Uh, kind of alienated my family, getting buried in my work, paid thousands in bribes to the Ugandan government to make this stuff happen, floated HFC on about 20 grand a year and then ran out of money. Um, and on top of everything, Uganda refused me a work permit, so they were getting ready to kick me out of the country. Um, what they were saying was, we have a technical college, we don't need technical people. That's what they told me. And uh, I didn't have a college degree, and they said, well, we have people with master's degrees that got their master's degree in Uganda, so we really don't need you. And that was, obviously, that was kind of a kick in the butt. And uh, in January of this year, I basically went to Shmukan with this attitude. I was like, you know what, I'm done. You know, forget this noise. I want to get back. I want to hack the living crap out of something and get paid for it. And uh, that will be that. But uh, some people got in my way. Uh, some of our lead volunteers basically wouldn't have anything to do with that. People kept donating equipment. Even at the time, I was like, I don't want any more. <laughs> Forget these people. And you kept sending me equipment. I was like, holy crap, I got thousands of emails. And then the work permit came through. The chief of police in Uganda was like, I'm not about to let this guy go. <laughs> we need help. <laughs> We're getting the crap hacked out of us. And he personally signed the work permit, walked it right down to immigration stood there in front of the, the agent's desk and was like, sign this thing. And the, the agent looked at his paper and went, I don't know, it looks fake. <laughs> <laughs> like it's the chief of police, the highest ranking police officer in the country handing you the document, you're gonna tell him it looks fake. But it went through and on top of that, my family wanted me to stay. 
So um, in the end, this kind of stuff kept me going. You know, we, feed, we trained about 800 people in that training center, fed about 1,500 families. We had about 30 full-time employees that we were supporting. Um, our staff salary at the keep, we ran out of personal money, which was funding the keep. You know, we basically had a miracle that came in and paid for six months of salary for all those people at the keep so we could leave that open. You know, and, and again, my family wanted to stay. So um, again, uh, thank you for helping me turn the corner. So here we are, Hackers for Charity 2011, which almost didn't exist. Uh, we're doing some things differently. For one, we're being a little more picky about who we give computers to. Uh, this is one piece of the AOET equipment, which was redonated, ironically enough, to one of their competitors. And as you can tell, the place is absolutely spotless. I mean, we did a, we did a great install, as always, but it is absolutely spotless. It's being used, so we're being a little smarter in how we do that. Um, Things like, you remember this food program where we were, you know, giving out food and, and the, the locals turned it into something bigger and more sustainable. Well, we really liked that, but that didn't have anything to do with us. That was people on the ground that said, I'm going to take what you gave me and twist it a little bit like this to make it bigger. And we saw value in that. Um, it, things like this kept happening. Like this, this was a great shot because it shows street kids. These are basically homeless kids taking computer classes. And I felt pretty good about that, right? You know, I was like, wow, this is, this, is, this is cool. This is a great photo op. You know, but at the end of the day, if these kids aren't eating and they're not in school, what does it matter if they're taking computers? They're just going to, you know, die or turn to crime. Well, that's where a group called the Sanctuary would come in, and they would do all of that stuff, give them housing and school and, and all that stuff while they put their lives back together. So this is how we were operating, right? I mean, we were kind of doing this. We were trying to feed people and, you know, do this individual stuff. Uh, but really, to have a bigger impact, it's more effective to work with the organizations that are on the ground helping out these people. So for every single one of those organizations that we help, we help out hundreds or thousands of people. So our focus started to change a little bit, and we started to support those organizations with their need. A lot of them relied on technology, but they didn't have anybody to fix their stuff. They didn't have any way to keep viruses off their machines, so we started supporting them. Uh, while they're fighting the good, good fight, uh, we're getting them back on track technically and you know, giving them cappuccinos and, and milkshakes to help them brush the dust off and get back to it. And so you know, it's not insanely fun to work on old machines or set up internet solutions, but it's absolutely what's required. It's what these people need to, to keep doing what they're doing, so that's what I do. Um, now, I would like to say that at this point, things started to become rosy. I mean, this is the good ending, right? You know, things go up, they go down, they go up, they go down, and then we end on a really good note, and I'd like to say that that's where I was six weeks ago. <laughs> uh, but the truth is, I absolutely was not. The, the training center, which was our crown jewel, basically fell apart. I watched it fall apart before my very eyes. And it happened in a process that had been going on for an entire year. All of our profits from the training center were stolen by an insider. Every single shilling that we made was ripped off by someone we trusted. Some of our employees started setting up competing businesses using money that they had stolen from us and equipment that they had stolen from us to start competing businesses with the same exact mission statement as us behind my back. They filed with a lawyer that you know, um, we used, and the lawyer called me and said, hey, you starting a new business? Because somebody just registered one that sounds just like yours, and they're using your P.O. box. And it turned out these were my employees that were doing this, and when I called them on it, they said, no, that wasn't us. There is no business. And so basically I said, well, sign this paper that says you had nothing to do with this, and they signed it, and then I showed them their employment contract that says well, you, we can let you go for dishonesty just like that and let them go. In the midst of this, it completely gutted our training center. We lost everything. We were down to basically one full-time employee and one part-time employee, and it wasn't enough. We had to shut down. So I posted on my blog, this is becoming a pattern. <laughs> um, I posted on my blog what was going on, and I said, you know what? The only thing I can think to do is to run this place 100% free 100% of the time and just train people. That's to the heart of what we're trying to do. So. I, I said, these are our expenses, this is what we need to run the place, is anybody interested in helping? Um, this, an interesting tweet went out, uh, aimed at Rapid7, that said, uh, how many black hat parties is $9,420, which is what we needed to run the center, including salaries and everything for a year. It was a very interesting tweet. Uh, well, interestingly enough, Rapid7 stood up and says, fine, okay, we'll do it, we're gonna pledge five grand 
and we want the community to make up the rest. So Rapid7 stepped in and pledged $5,000. But, of course, not to be outdone, the hacker community turned around and trumped them with a donation of $6,192. And it was a bunch of uh, little donations. Uh, most of the people that jumped in in that uh, first time period are listed here. So in two weeks, basically, the hacker community and one company got together and paid for our training center, and in the end, we got enough money to run the training center for 14 months without spending a penny of HFC money or requesting any money from our students. So now the training center is 100% free. That's because of the community. Now, some other interesting things were, were bubbling. Um, back in 2010, uh, right here uh, in, in uh, Louisville, or uh, right in Louisville, there was a uh, Metasploit class stood up, okay? Um, by uh, these folks, some of these names you recognize, right? They decided they were gonna do a Metasploit class and they were gonna donate all the proceeds to HFC. It was, it was a ridiculous thing, it came out of left field. You know, I was absolutely blown away by this. Um, and some of our folks, Rob Dixon and Bill Gardner from 304 Geeks went down and handed out t-shirts and thanked everybody and you know, thanked them for their support. And this was just an amazing thing. Now this was all going on when I was in the midst of just pulling my hair out. So it almost slipped by my radar that it even happened. Internet connectivity being what it was and everything else, I just almost missed it. Um, some other interesting things started to happen. October 2010, the HackerCon 1 started coming together and those same folks from Louisville got together and said, we're gonna be your first round of speakers. We're gonna support this thing. This is an HFC conference called HackerCon. We're gonna support this thing and these were our first string of speakers. Um, they just volunteered and they got the con off the ground. Um, KC and uh, Vivek from Security Tube blogged about this thing. At 40 bucks a head, 100 people showed up to support HFC. Carlos Perez came all the way from Puerto Rico to be you know, the lead speaker. Uh, he wore his, his HFC t-shirt on the, the Paul.com pod, podcast and he, he just wore it with pride. You know, and, and we were proud of that as, as well. So October 21st through the 23rd in Charleston, HackerCon 2 is going on. We need to sell 100 tickets this week to make that happen. I have no doubt about that thing. Uh, and of course, this all leads back here <laughs> to DerbyCon. That same group of people that stood up that Metasploit class, well, guess who's running this thing? And they're supporting us again. They're paying, they paid for my ticket here and they're paying me to be here yapping at you. So they've been huge supporters of us. So uh, this is uh, yet another thank you. All right, so the, the question is kind of what's next? Uh, there's a lot of things that we kind of have uh, in mind, but I don't want to drive any of this stuff. Um, I kind of want the community to drive it. That's what this thing is always about. When HFC is at its best, it's about community. It's not about me and me trying to push anything in Uganda or anywhere. Uh, just t today's paper, USA Today, front page, the new faces of poverty, tells us very clearly that 46 million people in this country, 18% of families are now considered poor. It's an all-time high. Um, I don't have to throw rocks from my house in Jinja anymore to hit people that are destitute. You can throw them right from your house. So there's a huge need here. What are we gonna do about that? We'll see. I mean, we have some community support. I'm open to ideas. I'm looking for people to spearhead some local campaigns. Sky's the limit, but I'm not gonna dictate anything. It's better to just let it go and, and uh, we'll help wherever we can. We need lots of help. We need volunteer staff. I always tell people we need volunteers. Uh, if you're looking for something to do, drop us a line. But some interesting facts are starting to come forward. Uh, there are a lot of charities out there that need help. I have a heart for, for charities that are struggling. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of charities that need help. There's a lot of corporates that are doing the corporate giving stuff. Uh, but at the same time, there's a shortage of InfoSec professionals. It's all over the news. There's a shortage of InfoSec professionals. And everybody's going, well, where are we going to find InfoSec professionals? And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, you know, you don't have to go far. So there's an interesting concept behind finding corporate responsibility programs in the infosec field that are giving time and resources and merging that with volunteers that are in this community that you know, really don't have the job that they're looking for but they need job experience and they wanna do something. Well, how do we, how do we make them kinda work together? 
right? I mean, you have unwashed volunteers that are like, I got the skills, dude, just give me anything, I'll hack the living crap out of it and then show you how to fix it, but they don't have a resume. And then you've got the InfoSec guys that are career guys that are being told by their bosses, you'll do this eight hours a month, you know, or you'll lose your job, you know, and what about the issue of trust with these, you know, the, the unwashed volunteers? How do, we, how do we mix this? And the question is, what do you get when you mix corporates and the hacker community? Uh, well, the first obvious thing is you get free beer at conferences. <laughs> which ain't too bad. That's best case scenario. Worst case scenario, you get, you know, something like this or God forbid. <laughs> Uh, so we came out with this idea. Uh, my friend Marcus Carey and I had been having this discussion for a long time. How do we work this thing out? How do we do this thing? You know, get people experience and get people that are in the corporates to play along. So we launched this at DEF CON. This is uh, infosecwithoutborders.org. Um, and it's a play, obviously, on Doctors Without Borders. Our goals are pretty simple. Uh, the goals are to help charities, to engage uh, corporates in their corporate responsibility programs and combine them with sort of the unwashed volunteers that are looking for experience. Um, now, this, this is a term which has been in the media an awful lot lately, and um, I'm not sure I like it. Um, I'm not sure I like the context that it's been used in lately, that the media has said this is what this thing is. I mean, the definition of hacktivism is what? I mean, according to my Mac, <laughs> I'm not going to say it's always right, but it's never steered me wrong. A computer hacker whose activity is aimed at promoting a social or political cause. Now, I mean, this is right up the alley. This is what the kind of stuff that we want to do. We want to promote positive paths and promote positive cause, causes. Um, so we've, we've partnered. Rapid7 has stepped forward and said, we're going to use our corporate responsibility program to help you. We're going to use the hours that we have. We're willing to help you help charities, which I think is a huge first step. Uh, Backtrack has been a huge supporter of ours throughout the years. Um, there's, a, there's a huge Backtrack partnership coming. I'm not going to get into the details yet. Pony Express has donated some equipment to us, given us some discounts so that we can do remote pen tests. You know, mail the, mail the, uh, the Pone plug to a destination and have somebody come in and do a pen test and all that stuff. And uh, of course, Hackers for Charity is uh, behind this partnership as well. So again, infosecwithoutborders.org. So uh, what's next is we just need to talk about it. We need to, I need ideas, I need people that are like, you know, I kind of believe in what you're doing. I see the power of uh, working with the community to do some positive stuff. And uh, you know, so let's talk about it. Fill out uh, the form on hackersforcharity.org or on infosecwithoutborders.org. Either volunteer or give us your advice. Um, just drop me a line, because in the end, this is nothing without you guys. Um, you know, I can, I can work till I'm dead doing all that I'm doing, but without you guys, it, it doesn't matter at all. So let's, uh, let's drive this thing. So in conclusion, uh, here, here were my goals. Um, the first one was to give you advice, and the advice is pretty clear. I've said this before. My advice to you is make a difference. Um, you know, you can slave at your career, and you can slave getting skills and making money and all that stuff. Um, no matter how successful you get, happiness is just going to evade you unless you're doing something positive. You know, you really need to do something for somebody else until you sort of get that feeling of fulfillment. Um, for me, it took, you know, a spiritual thing to kick me in the butt. That might not be the same with you guys, but this is absolutely my advice from somebody who's made it to the top and found the view to suck is uh, to make, make a difference. Uh, the other thing that I said I was going to do is embarrass myself, but that's the second part of my advice is, you know, embarrass yourself. <laughs> you know, go, go against the trends. Don't do what's expected of you. Don't be afraid of failure. You know, because failure is really what defines the best things that we're capable of. And uh, the third thing that I said I was going to do is uh, say thank you. So uh, that's it. Thank you guys very much.